All right. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a uh, great pleasure to welcome you uh, this evening. My name is Tarek Masood. I am a uh, professor of public policy here at the Kennedy School, and I'm the faculty chair of our Middle East uh, initiative. And it's really my great pleasure to welcome you to this first in our spring series of what we are calling Middle East Dialogues, uh, which are a series of conversations that I'm having with individuals whom I believe hold uh, varied and vital perspectives, not just on the conflict in the region, but on the paths towards a more peaceful and prosperous future for the people of that part of the world. And our guest this evening is one of the few people on the planet who doesn't need uh, an introduction, uh, and that's uh, Mr. Jared Kushner. He was a senior advisor uh, to President Donald Trump from 2017 to 2021, where he handled a number of vital portfolios uh, from you know, prison reform to trade agreements with Canada and Mexico to our response to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to the reason that we're here tonight, which is peacemaking in the Middle East. And when I put together this series, Jared Kushner's name was the very first name on my list. And that's because he was the architect of the Abraham Accords, which I personally believe to be one of the most significant developments in the Middle East in recent memory. And he's just generally a deal maker uh, par excellence. Uh, and if there's any part of the world that I think needs really excellent deal makers right now, I think it's the Middle East. So I'm honored that he accepted my invitation to return to Harvard, his old uh, stomping grounds to have an open and candid conversation about some of the toughest issues on the planet right now. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk for about 45 uh, minutes, and then uh, we'll take questions from my students who I will call on. And uh, those of you who know me uh, know that you should never put a middle-aged Egyptian male in charge of timekeeping. So I'm going to try to uh, keep everything on time so that we can end uh, at the appointed hour. So uh, first, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jared Kushner. Jared, thank you so much for being with us. So can I just want to dive right into the war on, on Gaza. Um, we all know of the gruesome terrorist attack that happened on October 7th. More than 1,200 innocent Israelis uh, brutally murdered by Hamas terrorists. More than 200 people taken hostages. Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu vowed a fearsome military response which was designed or intended to make sure that this uh, never happens again. And now today, four months later, more than 25,000 Palestinians are dead. I can't tell you what percentage of them are Hamas terrorists, but we know that half of them are women and children. We know that more than a million Gazans are trying to shelter in the south of the country. They're amassing on the border with Egypt. Many reports indicate that Gazans are now enduring a famine, and Israel is poised to begin a ground operation in Rafah that we think will take many more civilian lives. We know Israel's being accused of genocide in front of the International Court of Justice, and even President Biden says that the Israeli operation has been over the top. But I'm guessing you don't support calls for a ceasefire, and I want to ask why. Or jump right into it, so it's good. Um, First of all, it's really great to be here, and thank you for putting on this dialogue on the Middle East. I think it's a topic that uh, I spent a lot of time, I spent four years working on when I was in the White House. It wasn't an issue that I had a lot of experience with, so I really came into it with a, a blank slate. I wish I'd been in some classes like this and gone to lectures like this when I was at Harvard. Um, maybe it would have actually given me a, a worse outcome, but, uh, but, but, I, but I... Wait a minute! <laughs> but I hope today I'll, I'll share with you some of my experience and perspectives, but I will say that um, you know, throughout my time, I was always, um, a lot of the things that I, I would say, a lot of the things I would do were um, fairly heavily um, complained about or criticized from, I would say, the consensus thinking. And so um, I, I think that, number one, when looking at the current situation, um, I, I tried to look at everything kind of first principles, and I try to say, you know, w what's going on? What should it be? What are the right uh, actions? And, and what I find is that there's a lot of uh, emotion with this issue. 
uh, some of it justified, some of it uh, unjustified uh, for a whole host of it. And what I would say is this, I think that, um, number one, I take a step back and say, like, why are we here? Right? You go back to 2021, and when uh, I was able to go back to my normal life uh, after leaving uh, office, uh, our four years in service, we, we basically left the Middle East where uh, it was very calm. Right? It was calm, it had momentum. Um, you think about uh, ISIS, they were basically, uh, the, the caliphate was gone. Syria, the civil war had mostly uh, stabilized uh, in the sense that you didn't have, I think, 500,000 people were killed. Uh, when we started, Yemen was destabilized, Lib Libya was destabilized, uh, ISIS had a caliphate the size of Ohio, and Iran was flush with cash, and they were basically using that money to fund Hamas, to fund Hezbollah, to fund the Houthis, and they were on a glide path to a nuclear weapon. So we inherited a really, really bad um, hand, and then with the JCPOA agreement, which was probably one of the dumbest agreements I think ever uh, negotiated, just as anyone who like studies agreements and deals, um, that really left us in a bad situation. So we worked hard. We tried to regain trust. We did a lot of work, and we could talk about that later. Um, but the way we left the region was basically uh, we had six peace deals in the last six months that we were there. Uh, less, I think in the last maybe four or five months mm -hmm. that we were there. So um, you had, uh, we, we took a different approach to the Palestinians. Uh, we're able to make peace between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, and then with Bahrain, then Sudan, then uh, Kosovo uh, uh, was able to recognize uh, Morocco, uh, and then finally, we resolved the GCC dispute, which put everything on a pretty good glide path. Uh, Iran was basically broke. They were out of foreign currency reserves, which meant that no money was going to any of these terrorist organizations. And then in addition to that, the Palestinians basically were out of money too. We'd stopped funding UNRWA. Uh, you know, we saw that UNRWA was basically taking the money um, that we were giving them to the United Nations. It was, you know, it was taxpayer dollars that we were giving to the United Nations. We thought it was going to you know, fund uh, terrorists, to, to give them energy, to give them resources. Uh, we saw a lot of their schools and their, their, um, their mosques were basically where they would hide the bombs and the missiles and, and their munitions. And we thought the education that they were giving was really a very, very poor education that was radicalizing the next generation. So we said, you know, oh, okay, there we go. Um, so, um, so basically we thought that the, um, that the right thing to do basically was to stop funding that. And that was uh, the way that we wanted to kind of advance. So uh, we went forward, we were able to create the peace deals. Then you kind of move forward um, in the region uh, for three years. We thought that Saudi had the ability to do a normalization deal. And we had uh, worked with the Biden administration in order to, um, in order to help them uh, you know, get that uh, pathway to follow uh, the pathway that we were in. Um, so now you forward three years, you have the attack, uh, which was awful. Um, you, through not enforcing the sanctions on Iran, uh, they were able to get funding, which they were able to then give to all these different groups. You saw a lot more rise up in the extremism. And I think that uh, America not standing with Israel in the way that they should be uh, led to a lot of this occurring. So, um, so you have a situation now where Israel has the right to defend itself, right? They're in a position where they had a brutal attack. I mean, imagine America, somebody coming over the border, uh, brutally raping, uh, killing civilians, uh, doing all these different things. I mean, that's something that I think would be, you know, quite horrific for a lot of us. And then I think the sentiment was basically, how do we uh, put this in a position where we uh, attack back? So I think that what Israel's done is they're saying, how do we secure ourselves so this doesn't happen again? Uh, obviously, one death is too many deaths. You don't want any deaths in Israel. You don't want deaths of Palestinians. Uh, but I think right now the situation is, is a complex one. Uh, but I do th hope that with the right leadership, they'll be able to find a right way to get it to a better place. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, this was great because you, you, you definitely preempted one question that I was going to ask you, which was, you know, President Trump has been saying that uh, this would never have happened on his watch. But, but before we get to that, I just want to ask, I, I just want to think about this problem for a minute. You know, one thing I associate Jared Kushner with is uh, creative deal making, thinking outside the box. Do you have a proposal or an idea or a sketch for how we end this crisis? Sure. So I think that the dilemma that Israeli leadership has right now is do you do a short-term deal that leaves you more vulnerable in the future? Or do you take this current situation and try to figure out a way where you can create a paradigm where your citizens will be safe and this will not happen again? So uh, it's a very, very tough dilemma to be faced with if you are the uh, leader of a country. So uh, what I would do right now if I was Israel is I would try to say, uh, number one, uh, you want to get as many civilians out of, out of Rafah as possible. I think that you want to try to clear that out. Uh, I know that with diplomacy, maybe you get them into Egypt. I know that that's been refused. But with the right diplomacy, I think it would be possible. 
but in addition to that, the thing that, um, that I would try to do if I was Israel right now is I would just uh, bulldoze something in the Negev. I would try to move people in there. I know that won't be the popular thing to do, but I think that that's a better option to do so you can go in and finish the job. I think there was one decision point they had. Do we go into Gaza? Do we not go into Gaza? They had the hostages. There really was, I think, no choice uh, but to do that. Uh, I think that they, they were smart to go slowly and deliberately. Uh, Gaza's uh, booby-trapped like crazy. They have over 400 miles of underground uh, tunnels. And so I think that they've taken some of the right steps in order to go there. But you have to, again, I think Israel's gone way more out of their way than a lot of other countries would to try to protect civilians from casualties. Uh, but I do think right now opening up the Negev, creating a secure area there, moving the civilians out, and then going in and finishing the job would be the right move. Is that is that something that they're talking about in Israel? I mean, that's the first I've really heard of somebody aside from President Sisi uh, suggesting that these uh, that the Gazans who are trying to flee the fighting could take refuge in the Negev. Are people in Israel seriously talking about that possibility about hosting Gazan refugees in what is considered "quote unquote" Israel proper? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, but that would be something you would try to work on. I'm sitting in Miami yeah. Beach right yeah. now, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this situation, and I'm just thinking, what would I do yeah. if I was there? And again, you look at, I mean, it, it, with Israel, it's just it's a different, it's a different thing, right? In Syria, when there's refugees, Turkey took them, Europe took them, mm -hmm. Jordan took them. For whatever reason, here in Gaza, there's refugees from the fighting, from an offensive uh, attack that was staged from Gaza. Israel's going in to do, um, you know, a long-term deterrence mission. And it's just, it, it's unfortunate that nobody's taking the refugees. Again, I, I think that the American government should probably have done a little bit of a better job to find a solution to that. As, yeah. as a broker, I think that there would have been a way. But if that's not a viable option, I think from Israel's perspective, um, it, it's just something that should be strongly considered. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, obviously the reason they're not, you know, for example, the reason the Egyptians don't want to take the refugees, in addition to, of course, there being the domestic uh, uh, unrest that could result or the instability that could result, but also there are real fears on the part of Arabs, and I'm sure you talk to a lot of them who think once Gazans leave Gaza, Netanyahu's never going to let them back in. Um. Maybe, but I'm not sure there's much left of Gaza at this point. So, you know, if you think about even the construct like, you know, Gaza, Gaza was not really a historical precedent, right? It was the result of, of a war, right? You had tribes that were in different places, but then Gaza became a thing. Uh, Egypt, you know, used to run it. And then, you know, over time, you had different governments that came in different ways. So you have another war, you know, usually when wars happen, um, you know, borders are changed historically over time. And so my sense is, is I would say, how do we deal with the terror threat that is there so that it cannot be a threat to Israel or to Egypt, right? I think that both sides are spending a fortune on military. I think neither side uh, really wants to have, you know, a terrorist organization enclaved right between them. I mean, Gaza's waterfront property. It could be uh, very valuable to, uh, if people would focus on kind of building up, uh, you know, livelihoods. You think about all the money that's gone into this tunnel network and into all the munitions, if that would have gone into education or innovation, uh, what could have been done? And so I think that um, it's a little bit of an unfortunate situation there, but I think from Israel's perspective, I would do my best to move the people out and then clean it up. But I, I don't think that Israel uh, has stated that they don't want the people to move back there afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, okay, there's a lot to talk about there. Uh, the, the last thing I wanted to just get your reaction to on, on this is the, um, you know, you, you saw uh, uh, Tom Friedman's column on Tuesday uh, about, uh, 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 you know, where he put forward a plan to get out of this, and it's called Only MBS and Biden Can Redirect the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. And he says, Biden should recognize the Palestinian Authority unilaterally as a state, and MBS should go to Jerusalem like Egyptian President Anwar Sadat did in 1977, and he should say, I'll normalize with Israel, I'll recognize West Jerusalem as your capital, and I'll even pay to rebuild Gaza if you recognize a Palestinian state with Egypt. East Jerusalem as its capital. What do you think? Good idea? No, I, I don't think that's a good idea. I think that there's certain elements of it that are correct. I, I think proactively recognizing a Palestinian state would essentially be rewarding an act of terror that was perpetrated into Israel. So it's, it's a super bad idea in that regard. Um, I, I, the, the way that we did it was like a little bit inverted from there, right? So 
um, when, when we were working on the Palestinian issue, which we spent a lot of time on, and, and up until October 7th, the Biden administration really did not burn a lot of calories on it. They basically said, this is a, a lost effort. Mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't spend time on it. But we spent a lot of time uh, developing a plan. And you can go online, uh, uh, go uh, Google Peace to Prosperity. You'll find the plan that we put out in the White House, about 180 pages, very detailed. We started out, I met with um, the Palestinian negotiators, the Israeli negotiators, and I asked them, basically a form of simple questions. First, identify, like, what are these people actually fighting over for 70 years, right? And it came down to a list of, like, 11 issues, of which there were only really three of them, right? One was kind of the land barrier. Um, and I kind of looked down, and I said, well, any outcome is kind of arbitrary, right? Because it's a compromise between two positions. Uh, you have the religious sites, where they threw in a lot of issues like, you know, sovereignty, does sovereignty belong to God? Does it belong to this? You have basically two sites, one under the other, that both religions think is very critical to them. But I said, well, what do we really want if we, you know, get all the technical people out of the room? What we want is people to have the ability to pray freely. And if you think about Israel, um, the, the, the Jerusalem was, was really controlled by Jordan until the 1967 war. Israel took over. It was a defensive war, right? Israel was attacked by Jordan. They basically came in, uh, they attacked by Egypt and Jordan. Preemptive. Preemptive, but Egypt was amassing all of its planes okay. at the border. They, they, uh, Jordan had given over its military under the control of, of the Iraqis at the time. And so what they did is they did a preemptive attack. They knocked out the Egyptian Air Force. They sent message to the Jordanians saying, please do not attack us. The Jordanians started martyring, uh, mortaring in. They basically then went over. They took over Jerusalem. They were surprised they got so far, and they kept going, and were able to go all the way to the, to the sea, right? So, so that was kind of the, the history of where that was. So uh, but before then, uh, no Jews were allowed to pray in, uh, in Jerusalem, right? And then you basically had a situation where a lot of the Jewish cemeteries, a lot of the religious sites were used as places to, to store animals. They were, they were really uh, desecrated in bad ways. Israel then wins the war. Israel's a very, very poor country at the time. Uh, what do they do? The first thing they do is they pass something called the Protection of Holy Places Law, which basically took money that they really didn't have at the time and said, we're going to restore all of the religious yep. sites. So if you think about it, from 1967 till today, Israel's been a fairly uh, responsible steward of all these religious sites for Christians, Jews, Muslims. Every now and then you have tussles when people try to make it. They've allowed King Abdullah to be the custodian of the mosque. And if you think about that, that second issue, it's really just about allowing people to live freely. Uh, the third issue that I thought was critical was really just security, right? And you think about it, I mean, we think about it with different countries, but imagine you're like the governor of New Jersey, and then there's uh, people in Pennsylvania who are trying to kind of cross the border and, and kill your people. Um, you have to make a deal where you're making it less likely they're going to be able to harm your people than more. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to win an election, and it's not a prudent thing to do. So those are really only the three issues that mattered. And so what we did is we basically went and we said, asked each side, if you were the other side, what would you would accept? Uh, I found we weren't getting anywhere, so I started giving them a much more detailed uh, plan to react to. We started going back and forth. It ended up turning into like a 50-page operational plan on how to run things. And by the way, you'll find... Most people in politics don't want to put details out because details, you get attacked when I got attacked even for taking my job. So I kind of, after like the third day, stopped caring about being attacked. So I basically said, let me start putting things out and get people to react to it. So that was kind of the first part, which was the political part. The second thing we put together was an economic plan because as I was progressing down that road, I said, okay, let's say miraculously I get people to agree on borders. Let's say I get them to agree on a security regime. And let's say I get them to agree that we could all, you know, pray uh, properly and, and respect each other. Then what happens the next day, right? A lot of the region, a lot of what Israel's been used for has been a scapegoat, I believe, from leaders in the region to basically deflect from their own shortcomings at home. So I felt like, you know, most human beings want the ability to live a better life. And if we can create an economic plan that would basically allow people to live a better life, then maybe that would give them an ability to actually start focusing on the future, how to make their kids' lives better, instead of focusing on how do we solve problems in the past. Yeah. So. Uh, so that was really what we put together, and oh, sorry, uh, and that was really a framework for for how we thought we could make progress. So what Tom's talking about is basically saying, uh, uh, why don't we recognize a Palestinian state? When we were looking at a Palestinian state, the problem we saw there was basically that um, that they didn't have really institutions that can govern. I mean, the last person actually who did a good job governing there is actually here. It's Salam Fayyad. Uh, he was doing such a good job. He wasn't corrupt. You know, people were making more money. The services were being delivered. And he did such a good job that the leadership basically saw him as a threat and figured out how to run him out of town. I don't, want, I don't know if I'm speaking for you, but... It, I, it, I think you might also say the Israelis didn't help him either. But anyways, let's, we'll go. These are also complicated. I mean, yeah. that's, that, that, that's true. Yeah, but, that's one word. But what I would yeah. think here is that for a Palestinian state, when we looked at it, you say, what are the prerequisites that people need to live a better life? Number one is you need a functioning judiciary. You need, uh, you need a business climate. You need property rights. You need reasons for people to invest capital in order to, in order to give people an opportunity to, to grow. 
And so those conditions really don't exist. And so uh, the Palestinian leadership really has not passed any of the tests over the last you know, 30 years in order to, uh, I think, qualify for it. Now, I do think the notion of a Palestinian state uh, that doesn't have the ability to harm Israel from a security perspective is a worthy objective. Mm -hmm. But I think you need to figure out how do you make them earn it and at least have a viable pathway towards creating the institutions that can make it thrive and viable. Because if you call it a state and then people are, their lives are less good in five years from now, people will be angry and that will lead to more violence and conflict. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, threads to pull on here. So the, the first uh, thread I just want to pull on is, you know, you offered a diagnosis for how we got to October 7th. And your diagnosis is basically the Biden administration by allowing the Iran by, by, you know, allowing the Iranians to amass more wealth and spend it on their proxies. That's how you get uh, October 7th. If President Trump had been in charge, none of that would have happened. The, the, you know, the Iranians would have been continued to be starved of resources, et cetera. Right? Am I correct? I'm correct on on interpreting that hypothesis. Yeah, I'll add one more element, which yeah. is they, they squandered momentum. Yeah. And what I would say is like whether it's in business, whether it's in politics, momentum is one of like the most valuable things to try to seek. And and yeah. it's funny, I was talking, I wrote about it in my book actually with yeah. Bibi that you know, I was with him after he lost an election, yeah. uh, not a lost election. He was trying to form a coalition. Yeah. Somebody put a knife in his back and he basically lost it. And I was with him the next day. We thought we were going to announce something and move forward. And he was pretty despondent. And we, we met the next day and he would basically, you know, I figured, let me ask him questions about his history, his story. I mean, he's a historic figure that's been through so many different iterations. And he told me, you know, when I was, um, when I was a, a politician, I have bad patches. I would always try to get little wins because little wins lead to bigger wins and then bigger wins. And momentum is a very hard thing to get. We left the region with momentum. Again, the, the last piece, so we got Bahrain to do the deal with, um, with Israel. Saudi was basically watching this all very closely. Yeah. We got Saudi to allow us to put flights over yep. Saudi Arabia between Israel and UAE. Then in addition to that, uh, we, they've said, we need you to solve the issue with us in Qatar. So we yep. went through, we got that negotiation done, which was very, very intense. So I finished that on January 5th um, and then flew back to the U.S., uh, thinking I would have a very quiet last couple of weeks in office. That turned out not to be the case. Um, and, uh, and, um, and so basically everything was good. What we basically, what they could have done was then said, let's sit with Saudi, let's go finish the job, let's finish the momentum. And so they basically changed policy. And I think that led to a reversion of momentum. They waited two years to get started and then get a stronger Iran, less trust, and I think that also contributed to it as well. Okay, so what, what would you say to the alternative hypothesis that says, actually, the reason we got October 7th is because the strategy that you had for peacemaking, which, you know, whose creativity, we're, I, I'm not going to question, it was quite creative, but by essentially neglecting the core of the issue, the, the Palestinians' desire to uh, determine their own fate, that you just created the circumstances where, you know, the, 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 the rejectionists would have the upper hand, that this is basically not the result of, you know, Iran or whatever. It's a result of the fact that, you know, the Trump administration spent four years completely ignoring, isolating, bypassing the Palestinians, handing them defeat after defeat after defeat. And then what, what do you expect? You're surprised when they act out? Right. So what I would say to that is that mo the, whoever would say that, that we didn't address the root cause of the situation, I don't think truly understood what the root cause of the situation actually is. Okay. And th this is what was actually so intriguing to me and, and what made me very insecure about my job in the beginning was that I came into this with, like I said, no foreign policy experience. Everyone who was criticizing was probably right. But I think my father-in-law, uh, who's the president, basically said, you know, it can't get any worse. Like, he can't do any worse than the last people who, you know, worked on it for 10 or 15 years and all failed. And then basically went and wrote books about how they didn't fail. It's just that the problem was too hard. And then somehow uh, they move on and they are considered the experts on the situation, having had zero accomplishments uh, on these uh, on this file. So th that's like, th that's the underlying function of what you're talking about. Uh, I saw this very simple. And actually, when I went to the United States, uh, you know, the UN Security Council, because um, they're always trying to condemn Israel and everything. It was very anti-Semitic, I think, the way that they conduct their business there. Um, I basically made a PowerPoint presentation. I don't know if anyone's ever made them a PowerPoint presentation, but coming from the business world, I said, maybe I can try to explain to these people, you know, why this is a rational thing in a very, like, you know, realistic place. I actually put this slide in my book where I basically made a slide uh, from Oslo Accords up until that day where I showed two lines going this way. And then I had a, um, a, uh, 
I had a, a, a dove for every time there was a peace talk that failed, and then I had a tank for every time there was a war. The two lines represented the following things. One was the uh, settlements, so basically the land that Israel was, was taking, and then the other one represented money going to the Palestinians, mm -hmm. right? So what happened was is every time a peace talk sale, uh, failed or a war occurred, the same two things occurred. The Palestinians got more money and the Israelis took more land. So both sides essentially got what they wanted, right? So neither, I thought, had really motivation to, to make the deal uh, based on their own politics and their own interests. And then the second thing was is I, I kind of looked at it and I said, these issues actually are not that hard to solve, which again, a lot of people laughed at me for saying that, but I basically said, we have to you know, figure out you know, how to just kind of push this forward. So when I looked at the Palestinian leadership, I basically said, it's kind of like, um, and there's a lot of other situations of refugee groups. They just haven't been able to like internationalize their, um, their, 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 their situation. The Palestinians were getting like three or four billion dollars a year in international aid. Right? We'd go to, we had a meeting in Washington with uh, Bibi Netanyahu. They have like a $500 billion GDP economy. They're a nuclear power, military superpower, technology uh, you know, uh, superpower. And uh, he would fly in on an El Al commercial plane with his team. Right? We'd meet with the head of a refugee group, Mohammed Abbas, and he would fly into Washington on a $60 million Boeing business jet. I mean, the whole thing was like strange. I went and I met with him one night. We're talking about different issues. And uh, he wants a cigarette, he puts a cigarette in his mouth, and so someone comes in, they light the cigarette for him. And I'm saying to myself, does this guy run a refugee group or is he a king? And so the whole situation, I thought, was designed for them not to solve it, right? And again, a lot of people were getting rich there, a lot of interests were, were being fed, and not a lot of people were doing it. So what we basically said is, we're going to actually address the issue, we're not going to deal with the symptoms of the issue, we're going to try to address the issue. And I think that was what we actually tried to do. Okay, so there, there's a lot to pull on here too, uh, with respect to uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Um, so, so I'm going to just stipulate at the outset some of the my favorite bits of this book are your uh, descriptions of conversations with Mahmoud Abbas, and I, he's I'm not uh, on his list of fans, but let me try to uh, uh, let me quote somebody who is on his list of fans, uh, your father-in-law. So he said, he told Barack Ravid, you know, Abbas, I thought he was terrific. He was almost like a father. Couldn't have been nicer. I thought he wanted to make a deal more than Netanyahu. What was your father-in-law getting wrong? Well, I think it was a, he was saying relative. Okay, relative. Relative. So okay, relative to Netanyahu, though. His view on Bibi was that Bibi was always working something, and, uh, and I, I think that he did not have faith that Bibi would come through. But I also think he was in his mind trying to kind of challenge Bibi to say, you're not going to come through, you're not going to come through, to kind of make Bibi kind of prove to him that he was going to come through. And that was kind mm -hmm. of the way we were setting the table, right? So what we did is we did things that we wanted to do anyway, right? President Trump campaigned that he was going to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. His view was is Israel's a sovereign nation, America's a sovereign nation, they have the right to determine their capital, and we have the right to recognize their capital, uh, yeah. right? Uh, move the embassy to Jerusalem, Golan Heights, I mean, who are you taking it from? Syria barely existed at the time, right? So, and, and Israel had occupied it for a long time. Recognizing Golan wasn't that big of a deal. And so we did all these things that built a lot of trust for us with the uh, Israeli public. And what happened was, is because of that, the Israeli public trusted President Trump. He, he got out of the JCPOA, he was strong on Iran, and he felt that he had the ability to say, this is a fair deal, and push Bibi to that place. Abbas would come, and in the meetings he would say, we're going to do a deal with you, we're going to do a special deal, I'm going to do things for you like I've never done for anybody else, we're going to make a deal, we really want to do it. I'd okay. be like, oh, it's amazing. So that was my first meeting, I walked away and be like, that was incredible, this guy is great. Okay. Then I went for my second meeting, I go all the way to Ramallah, I go in, it's thinking to myself, how is like a Jewish kid from New Jersey here in Ramallah, I got all the security guards. And then I meet with him again, and I say, okay, well, I'm ready to talk, like, you know, borders, what are we going to do? Like, what's your proposal? I want you to tell me, what would you do that you think the Israeli would, would accept? Jared, we're going to make a deal. We're going to make the best deal. I'm going to make a special deal for you. And I'm saying to myself, I really want to get into the details here. You know, my father-in-law is not a very patient person. And what I found was it was kind of like a broken record. And, and what I kind of realized, if you go back, uh, what I did at some point, I read actually Jimmy Carter's book, which was, which was interesting. I really wanted to get the it's full... Peace, not apartheid or something like peace, that. Peace, not apartheid. Yeah, yeah I, was, I tried to get like everywhere from like Dory Gold to Jimmy Carter. Like I really yeah. tried to get the spectrum of perspectives. Um, and in the back of it, he had in the, uh, the annex, uh, the Camp David uh, peace agreement. I was kind of reading through the agreement. I was like, you know, I actually should go read all the different drafts of agreements and let me go read some peace agreements to see what they actually are, right? Everyone's there trying to negotiate. But I said, let me go read some. And so then as I pulled up all of the different agreements that have been done, I saw the Arab Peace Initiative. And that's what Abbas said. I want in line with the Arab Peace Initiative. 
And so I pulled up the Arab Peace Initiative, and it was 10 lines, and it had no detail, and it was a concept, and it was generated you know, in a different place. And one of the tenets of it was, uh, we want a capital in East Jerusalem. And so I had a guy on my team who was awesome, a guy, Scott Leith, he was a military guy, and I said, he worked for John Kerry. His, his whole life has been working on this issue, but he was from the State Department, which was a much more, a different perspective than, say, a former business guy who's more of a pragmatist would have. And I asked him, I said, well, where does the Palestinian claim for East Jerusalem come from? You mean East Jerusalem as a capital, not as, a capital. Not as yes. belonging to them. Sorry, as a capital. I said, where does that come from? And he says, um, I actually don't know. I said, okay, well, go, go research and get back to me. Normally, he'd be back in my office in two hours. He didn't come back for two days. And he basically came back and he says, you know what, Jared? This is very interesting. He said, before the Palestinians kind of said that they were in charge of the West Bank, right, which basically was the, uh, the declaration, uh, which I think was in the late 80s? Yeah, 80, late 80s, 88, right? I think. Uh, so bef- until then, um, the, the Palestinian lands were basically territory of Jordan, right? Jordan, uh, b- the Palestinians were basically fighting with the Jordanians, um, causing problems there. And the Jordanians basically said, we've had enough of these people. Let's get them out of here. And they basically exiled Yasser Arafat to Lebanon, where he went there, caused a lot of trouble. They exiled him to Tunisia. So during that time, when the Palestinians were in the West Bank, their capital was Amman. So he's saying, like, actually, it was just through this declaration of the Palestinians. When they said, this is how we're forming our charter, this is what our rights are, they just said, and we're taking East Jerusalem as our capital. So it was just one of these things that kind of came down. Declaring East Jerusalem as their capital. Declaring, like, yeah. In other words, East Jerusalem was always going to be part of what a Palestinian state was because they had never ceded it. Yeah. Right? A part. Okay. What I would say about that, and this is also another notion, is that Again, because there's a lot of, uh, you'll hear people say, throw around a lot of words, like uh, they'll throw apartheid or, or right, East right. Jerusalem. My, my view is these words are like always up here. And then, again, somebody who wasn't part of the club of foreign policy experts, I said, well, explain this to me. Yeah. East Jerusalem, the boundaries of East Jerusalem have changed like eight times uh, over the course of history as well. So when they were saying that, I said, oh, well, there's nope, we, maybe we could expand East Jerusalem, give them a different part of it. So yeah. it, it's one of these things that, that if you're pragmatic about it, there's ways to solve a lot of these different issues if you want to do it. And what we found with Abbas was that there wasn't a great desire to engage because he was protecting the status quo, which was leading to lots of inflows of money. Okay, so I, I do not want to be the guy defending Abbas, but to just make this interesting, let so me I like him. Let me let so. me offer you an let me offer you the alternative uh, argument. First of all, there's a really amazing negotiator who said you always let the other guy go first. Who was that? Oh, it was Jared Kushner. It's in this book. Okay. So you go to Abbas and you say, hey, draw a map for me. A smart negotiator is going to say, hey, the map is Resolution 242, okay? Mm-hmm. The entire West Bank. If you've got, a, if you've got a, an offer you want to make, go ahead. But I'm, I'm certainly not going to negotiate against myself. Why didn't you recognize that that's what he was doing? Yeah, so, so that's what I saw was this kiss situation. So what I did was, since both parties were doing that, I just went and started drawing my own map. And I basically said, okay, I don't really care what happened, you know, before. Because if you think about the Middle East, a lot of it's just arbitrary lines drawn by foreigners anyway, right? You go back to Sykes-Picot, um, and you could argue that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of lines. Again, as I started unraveling, the, you know, the, the, this, the, this history, I was realizing that a lot of this was not as, as logical or as sacrosanct as everyone thought it was. So, so what I basically said is I said, okay, let me come up with a 2017 version, right? What I'm basically going to do is look at, say, if you go back to 2006, Israel uh, unilaterally withdrew all of their settlers from Gaza, and it was a political disaster. What did they get for it? They left all these greenhouses. They left all this industry. It was all destroyed. They ended up with a group with a, you know, a terrorist group took over. And then since then, they've been firing rockets into Israel, and Israel's been less safe because of their withdrawal, and October 7th proved that. But this was even before that. I said, yeah. there is no way Israel's uprooting any of these settlers. So I said, let me just say, if I want to give the Palestinians a state, let me figure out how can I draw a line and just take all the places where they're settlers and just make a new line here and then figure out how do you swap land here and there and then make whatever's not contiguous, contiguous with, you know, today you got uh, tunnels, you got bridges, all these different things. How do you make it connectable so that it could be a functioning state and then go from there? So I started drawing a line and then I figured I'd let each party react to it one way or the other. We ended up putting it out. I, again, I, I fought a lot with BB and his team. I, I threw it on the map. The, you can't have this, you can't have that. I said, okay, let's move the line here and there. But that was how I started. I was never able to get the Palestinians to engage off of that map to say, we want this, but. 
Yeah. So th this is interesting. I mean, obviously, you know, you're a great negotiator. I'm a fat professor who's never even negotiated his salary properly. But, you know, so, 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 but, but. That's um, usually you, what the people who are doing well say. You know, you know, but, but, the, <laughs> but the, 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 um, the, the way you present, I did think it was, you really deserve a lot of credit for getting Benjamin Netanyahu to put down on paper the borders of a Palestinian state that he would accept, mm -hmm. okay? You were the first person to really get them uh, to do that. And not just him. Yeah. We got the opposition during a heated election to agree to, to, agree to well. it. To agree to massive it. Massive step forward. Yeah, M massive step forward. And one of the great things that you say in this book, by the way, which I actually think is ex exculpatory of the Palestinians, is you say everybody says Camp David 2000, the Palestinians walked away from a really detailed agreement. There wasn't a detailed agreement, right? So that's actually a little bit exculpatory for the Palestinians. But in any case, you finally get Benjamin Netanyahu to put down on paper his, what he will accept. And just from my research, yeah. I was not able to find like any text of a deal that was anywhere near close to a negotiation. I also thought the power dynamics were different, whereas what I was told is that uh, Arafat was basically not being supported by the Arabs. The Arabs wanted to keep this thing alive and they didn't want him to make a deal. Whereas today, you know, when we got in, I recognized a different dynamic where kind of the Arabs, I felt, wanted him to finish this, which gave me a lot more ability to lean into things. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. So, so, but the point is, so you've got now Benjamin Netanyahu's drawn the map. Why do you, why do you take this to uh, Abbas, or why do you announce this as the American plan to which the Israelis have signed on? Like, you are, you know, the American, You're, you've got this... Uh, position as the broker between these two parties. Why didn't you go back to Abbas and say, "Okay, here's what the is here's the Israeli position," and then let Abbas say, "Okay, no, I don't like this border. I don't like that." And then you, why didn't you do it that way? Why did you why did you present it in such a way where it looked like what you were trying to do was to give him an offer he couldn't accept, so that you could then say to the other Arabs. Ah, this guy's a rejectionist. I did my best. Can we now conclude some peace deals directly between you and the Israelis and leave these Palestinians uh, uh, on the side? I'll try to do this answer as short as possible, okay. but it's, it's going to be a little one. So, okay. number one, what I tried to do is set up the situation. So, when we moved the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, Abbas and his team said, we're not talking to you guys anymore. After a couple months, they came back. We kept the security cooperation going. Uh, but he broke ties with us diplomatically. And I remember at the time, uh, Rex Tillerson, who was the Secretary of State, said, we've got to go do something. Let's give him East Jerusalem. Let's do this because these guys are going to run away and we're not going to hear from them again for another decade. Mm -hmm. And I said, Rex, we're not doing it. He said, why? I said, they've trained American negotiators over time to say jump and we say how high. So, so I, give, I, I read that in the book yeah. and I thought that was an extraordinary. Give me an example of where we said to the Palestinians, when the, Pal the Palestinians told us jump and we did it. They always, everything with me was a threat. We're going to withdraw from the negotiation risk. I said, who cares? Okay. We, we give you guys $700 million a year. I don't care. Like, my view is if you're going to come and do it, great. If not, we're going to stop funding you guys. But that's how we're going to set the dynamic. Okay. But then the second thing I did was I said, um, we're not going to allow you to control whether we can negotiate this or not. So because they withdrew, I said, okay, I could stop. Now, the good news is I had other files to work on, right? I wasn't a sole person. But the reason why the U.S. were trained to chase them is usually it was an envoy whose sole job it was to deal with the Israelis and the Palestinians. And the Palestinians said, we're not negotiating. He had nothing to do. For me, I said, okay, I'll work on other things. That's okay. You know, I have other jobs here. And so what we basically did was we went and we started pushing forward with the plan. And my thinking was, is as I was speaking to the Arabs, they said, get an honest plan on paper from Israel, and we will try to push the Palestinians to take it, mm -hmm. right? Because they basically said, we want this thing resolved. So if they said, if you can put a credible offer, and they did not believe that we can get BB or United Israel to put forward a credible plan, I said, good, let's do it. Again, I, I was always willing to chase the crazy things, and I, I kind of liked it. So it, it was, it was um, so, and again, I felt like this was very important. Yes. So, so going after it and trying to settle things, I thought was, was critical. So we, went, we worked hard with Israel. We kept negotiating with them to get them more and more. Yeah. I didn't take them all the way to where I thought we could have gone. Security-wise, I, I was in, in full agreement with everything we put in our plan. Again, my, I, I really was very sympathetic to Israel. You can't make a peace deal and then be less safe the next day, right? You do a deal so that you're more safe. So that was number one. The borders, I felt like we should just be super pragmatic about it. And there was a couple of things in there that I knew we could swap around. So I left some meat on the bone for a boss. I'm going to get to the answer to your yeah, question. Yeah. So, so I, I kind of left some meat on the bone. Then when we announced the plan, so first of all, we surprised everyone by getting Israel to put out a very detailed plan. We had a unified Israeli government supporting it. 
We got very positive statements from the Arab countries saying we encourage both sides to negotiate on this basis, on the basis of this plan, which diplomatically was actually a very big step forward in the diplomatic world, right? Then what I did is I had the CIA deliver to a boss a copy of the plan with a note from us right beforehand, basically saying, um, uh, this is the plan we're putting out. Uh, we, we have built a lot of goodwill with Israel. We are willing to use that goodwill to try to make a fair deal that we think can resolve this. That, that's the question I'm asking. So why, why, why that framing? Why didn't you say, here's what the Israelis are offering. Let's show, give me your counteroffer. Why didn't you do that? That's essentially what the letter said, right? The letter basically from the president said, you know, we're happy to chat. And we, we basically, you know, we said, look, we're happy to chat. We're moving forward this. We, we had to set the dynamic where the train was moving forward with or without him. And this is what I do believe too, right? They were very isolated. They were basically running out of cash, right? Iran was running out of cash. And we had the only thing on the table. The Abraham Accords were now starting to collapse the pocket around them. And so basically what we were doing is we were trying to eliminate all of his escape, cat, escape paths and build him a golden bridge. Yeah. And then basically at some point we figured he'd go over the bridge. Yeah. I feel like, what if, I mean, I feel like the natural response to that is, you know, very clever deal making. I certainly would not want to be on the opposite side of a real estate transaction with you, but what you weren't recognizing is that Abbas has people to his right. He's got Hamas that he's got to contend with. And you were just making it absolutely impossible for him to make a deal with you. And all you were doing here is just proving the rejectionist point and making the average Palestinian think, yeah, absolutely, that America has no intention of actually being an honest broker or getting us a good deal. Look what they're doing to Abbas, who is their ally. So then the, maybe the only path is the path of this violent uh, resistance. Okay, so uh, I hope you're saying that in the context of being provocative or, or yes. devil's advocate, yes. because my sense is that's like the total conventional way of thinking about this. Yes. And again, I'm, I'm saying this like openly, like I was criticized by all of the conventional players on this because I did not approach but, this in a normal way. happened. Right, but, but let me go back to that point. Yeah. So the, the point there is that the, the other version of what that was said is that if you move the embassy to Jerusalem, the Middle East is going to have a war. That was the intel U.S. intelligence assessment. That was yeah. what uh, Abbas said. That's what every leader in the region said. Yeah. If you get out of the JCPOA, the world's going to end. If you move the embassy, the, the, the world's going to end. Yeah. Well, every time we did one of those things, we worked to mitigate the risk. And you know what happened the next day? The sun rose in the morning and it set in the evening yeah, yeah. And, and nothing happened. Okay. We had a little things. We managed them. It was no big deal. So our thinking was, is that if you're going to say that a boss can't engage with us and try to make a compromise because Hamas is, is to his, his other side, we thought the best way to empower him over Hamas was to make him the guy who delivered investment uh, uh, yeah. upside, yeah. Uh, 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 a compromise, better life for the people. And yeah. that's yeah. that's how we read the situation yeah. back in 2019, 2020. And I still believe at that moment, our assessment was correct. Yeah. Can I, you know, I want to move on to other issues, but I just want to like, you know, when, when I look at the way you negotiated with Bibi, okay, so you mentioned, for example, the, the, the move uh, to move the embassy to Jerusalem, for example. Like, every time you made one of these decisions and President Trump would say, hey, what am I getting for this? You want me to move the embassy to Jerusalem? What's Bibi going to give me? Oh, you want me to recognize Israeli sovereignty over the Golan? I've already done enough for Bibi. Why am I going to do this? And every time you would say to the president, hey, 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 we're building capital with the Israelis. We're building capital with Bibi. Why, why weren't you trying to build capital with the Palestinians? You know, first of all, Israel was the much stronger party, right? Yeah. And so at the end of the day, we felt like, getting the, the right pragmatic compromises out of them would take the capital. And we would have to convince them that the compromises we were going to ask them to take, we, we genuinely believed were in their interest. Keep in mind, all of the things we did for Bibi were things that we thought were the right things to do. So he was a political beneficiary of, the, beneficiary of them. Uh, he would tout them for his domestic and international popularity. But the reality is, is we were doing things that we thought were the right things to do. Why didn't you at least, you, you, why didn't you at least get him to free settlement? Say like, hey, I'm going to give you Jerusalem. I'm going to recognize the, the Golan. If you notice with us, the settlements were basically contained to areas. I mean, he did, he did pro forma stuff, but nothing that was that radical. He didn't go too crazy with us in the settlements. Okay. Fair, fair, but, but, but again, yeah. our, our, our strategy was basically have the tough conversations quietly, figure out how to mitigate. Again, you could have disagreement, but let's focus on the big things. I remember I got a call from Dave. David Friedman, um, who's our ambassador to Israel, and he said, oh, Jared, we have to deal with this. You know, two Israelis were stale. I said, David, I said, stop chasing rabbits. 
I said, our job is not to solve every single domestic Israeli issue. Our job is to focus on the elephants, right? The elephants are slower, they're bigger. Let's focus on the root cause of this. If we solve the, the root causes of the disease, the symptoms all go away. If you spend all of your time chasing the symptoms, you're gonna you wear yourself out. You're not gonna get anywhere. And that's what a lot of people did before us. So we stayed very laser focused on how do we make both sides uncomfortable yeah. to try and create an outcome. And, and I'll just say this too. Yeah. I mean, the Middle East peace is like a butt of jokes for many years, right? We actually did get some peace agreements done, which was pretty incredible. But I mean, th you're basically saying like, Jared, go work on probably one of the most impossible, complex, emotional, emotionally charged um, uh, problem sets in the history of the world. And so my view was, is like, it wasn't like you could look at it on one of your homework sets, okay, this is the right answer, or the wrong answer. You have like a million different wrong answers and maybe like one or two potential answers that could work out well. And so, like I said, we inherited the hand we, we, we got and we just played the cards as hard as we could. And I do think by the time we left, we left it in a very, very strong place. And had we had more time, again, I don't want to sound like one of these guys who leaves government saying this, but I did have a lot of track. I, my track record of success in the Middle East, I do think is second to none yeah. um, you know, over the last many years. And so uh, I do firmly believe that we put uh, the situation in a paradigm where it was much closer to being solved than it had ever been before. I'm going to just do, do one last question Please, on yeah, yeah. Bibi because, you know, I said I started this by saying you and your father-in-law disagree about uh, Abbas. You also disagree uh, about Bibi. And I guess what I'm trying to understand, because, you know, I read your book, I, I don't know why you still have a soft spot for Bibi. Like, this is a guy who, you know, Trump says, I don't think he ever wanted to make peace. You tell a story where uh, Netanyahu acts incredibly dishonorably, where, you know, when you're rolling out the peace plan, he gets up and just starts thanking the United States for agreeing to Israeli annexation of these bits of the West Bank that Israel in your plan would only get after the deal is agreed to by the other side. And, you know, you even say, like, when you first started talking to Netanyahu about a deal, he says, no thanks, and you even know, he says to you, look, I've survived by prime minister, as prime minister for 11 years by opposing a Palestinian state. So this, to me, is a guy who just purely in your book seems pretty sneaky, kind of like an obstructionist, a rejectionist, um, and yet you talk about him in the book at the, towards the end, you say he could be a powerful catalyst for change. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, he's a you know, it seems to me he was more an obstacle to the kind of change that you wanted and the U.S. wanted, which was to see a, a solution to the Palestinian issue. So what am I and your father-in-law getting wrong about this guy? Uh, so first of all, I, I think that there definitely is brilliance to him, right? And I think he's definitely committed himself to Israel for a very long time. Uh, some would argue maybe now too long, but, yeah. he's, um, but I think he's done a lot of good uh, in his time. And my general view is I was able to find ways to work things through with him. He didn't always make my life easy, but that wasn't his job. My job wasn't to make his life easy either. So uh, again, I, I understood his complications. I understood his flaws um, and I understood his brilliance. And I was able, I, and I just found it. And again, maybe I'm more malleable. I'm, I'm able to work with complicated people very well. That's maybe one of the things throughout all my different um, careers I've been good at. But I found that I was able to get the best out of him mm -hmm. in order to accomplish the things that I want, that I thought were in the best interests of America uh, and the region. Okay, so in other words, just bottom line on this, you are not one of the people who sees Benjamin Netanyahu as an obstacle to peace. I think that anyone, anyone who is a leader in the region can be both part of the problem and part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And I think that the job of those involved is to try to pull the best out of everyone to create the best possible outcome possible. Yeah, I, I definitely. So, so I'm, yeah. I know I'm being a little evasive with that, but I, I think it it really can depend on the day, and I think it depends on how you work with him to get yeah. the best out of. No, him. I love. It's that. in there. Yes. It's in there. That's I, what I love I'm saying. that. I love that. It's just it, it's clear from the book you did that with Netanyahu, but didn't you gave up on Abbas really quickly? I didn't give up. I was just taking a posture of we're not going to chase you. Yeah. yeah. And but I but I I left. I I think for him, yeah. I set a very delicious table. Yeah. Where if he would have come and engaged, I had a couple goodies in my pocket that I could have gotten. And I think I set the table for him to make a deal, yeah. have some big, big victories in negotiation, yeah. have $50 billion of investment, create a million new jobs, yeah. double the GDP, yeah. reduce the poverty rate, yeah. create like a real country. You know what I mean? So like I, I think I set him up to be a hero 
Yeah. He just, I, I don't, look, you know, there's one book I read about him, which, which actually, I had a different uh, assessment of him than the CIA. And I actually yeah. bought this book and gave it to the CIA after I read it, uh, which was called The Last Palestinian, which, um, w which was, was really incredible. And th th throughout his life, my, my, again, this is my assessment as just, you know, somebody who, who ended up in this job, was that throughout his life, he actually was for peace. Uh, he was for nonviolence. Uh, he hung around a lot of bad characters and was always on that side. But I do think that after they lost Gaza to Hamas in 2006, you basically had two non-states with two non-governments. And I think after that, he just went inward and his whole focus moved to survival and staying in power and keeping the kleptocracy running. And I think after that, it was more about how do I set this up to just survive? And he became afraid of making peace and taking the risks necessary. So that was kind of my assessment, which made him a little bit of a harder uh, character to deal with. We could probably talk about him for m much longer, but we, we shouldn't. You know, I want to, you saw the Vanity Fair uh, story that talks about you as a potential future Secretary of State. I don't know if people saw the New York Sun story from January that proposed your name for president of Harvard. But so what I want to do is I kind of want to get your, um, I, w I want to understand kind of how you think about international relations. And uh, um, the Golan story gives us a nice uh, 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 entry point into that. So, uh, you know, March 2019, you uh, encouraged President Trump to recognize Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights. And um, you say, basically, you say, acknowledging the reality that the Golan Heights belonged to Israel were the, was the right thing to do. Now, remember, I read that thing and I thought, wow, you know, Jared Kushner is talking about the right thing to do. I'm a realist in international relations. I would have guessed that you were as well. It's like, uh, there's no right or wrong. It's like well, interests. So what was the moral principle that was being satisfied by recognizing Israel's annexation of the Golan? Sure. Um, so even with all these jobs, my number one job that I'm focused on right now is being dad to my kids. Yeah, like right. that's, that's something after four years of very intense uh, time in government. Uh, that, that's the most important job I have now. Um, that's your way of saying you don't want to be Secretary of State. My job. That's my way of saying like I'm really liking the job I have right now. It's it's really it's it's really important. So um, so uh, so what I would say is that like the, the way that I kind of approach foreign policy, and again this came from not really having any experience in foreign policy, was basically saying every problem set I got almost. I think my disadvantage was that I didn't have any context. And my advantage was that I didn't have any context. So I would always try to take a first principles, result-oriented approach with the goal of being how do you maximize human potential. And in order to maximize human potential, you need to figure out how you can reduce conflict most of the time. And I always looked at everything and I say through that lens, like, you know, what are the interests of different parties? Uh, one thing I was also very good at, I think because I didn't come in lecturing people, there's a story I tell in the book where I went to meet with uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, who's now the president of the United Arab Emirates and the ruler. And I spent the first two hours basically asking him different forms of a question, which is, the U.S. has so much power. Again, we, we, we're, we're, we're a massive global superpower. Uh, if you were me, what would you do? And it took him about an hour to basically understand the question I was doing because he was so not programmed to actually meet with somebody from the US who wanted his opinion. And after uh, an amazing conversation, because he's a very, very wise and, and brilliant person, he basically said to me, he says, you know, Jared, I think you're gonna make peace here in the region. Mm. And I said to him, I said, well, why do you say that? He says, well, the US usually sends one of three kinds of people to see us. The first are somebody who comes and they fall asleep in meetings. He says, the second type of person they send is somebody who comes and they read me notes or a message and has no like, authority or power to interact and have a dialogue. He said the third person they send are people with real authority, but they only really send them to come and try to convince me to do things that are not in my interests. He says, you're the first person from the US at a senior level that's ever come here and actually asked questions and listened. And I said to him, well, that's because I really don't know, you know <laughs> how to do this, and this is a really hard problem. And so I said, I appreciate all of the wisdom and, and you can give me. So, so, so it's kind of a long way of saying that you know, every problem I kind of looked at fresh. Okay. Um, I was able to build trust with people, build real personal relationships. Um, I always answered the phone, right? People had issues. I always believe successful people answer their phone. Yeah. And, and so I was always available. I didn't always tell them yes. And I wasn't keeping a score saying, I'm going to do this for you, but you have to just me. My general view is, I'm going to do all the things you need, and you're going to do all the things I need. And hopefully at the end of this relationship, we both feel like we're way ahead. And so 
Uh, I was able to build a lot of trust. Um, uh, I was able to kind of see things from another side's perspective. I worked very hard to um, understand both sides' interests and say, where can we find common interests? And then the areas where we disagreed, instead of condemning people publicly, you'll notice I didn't do a lot of public talking. I didn't think it was that helpful. Uh, I'm not very big on being negative towards people or being critical. Um, and so what I basically did was we would find ways when we disagreed to disagree respectfully and quietly and then find ways to move forward. So, 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 so sorry, recognizing Golan's so, annexation was the right thing to do because... Well, it's just obvious. I mean, n number one, Israel had had it now for how many years? I guess they got in the 73 yeah. war? Yes, I believe. Right. So, so they, 67, I don't remember. It was, it was, they had it for a long time, the 67 war? Yeah. Yeah, so 67. 67 war. So they basically had it since the 67 war. Um, it clearly, strategically, it was a big uh, military war. important. Yes. They had it. They weren't given. And then they were saying, okay, who does it belong to? Syria. I mean, Syria at the time barely existed. Yeah. So it was a big thing where it said, A, they're never giving it up. B, Syria doesn't exist. Let's just recognize it. Let's, it moves things forward. And my view is like the more of these, what I would call kind of like stupid uh, conflicts that we allowed to exist, the more um, it would be there. And, and what I would say too is like the Middle East has a lot of natural negative inertia to it, right? It's yeah. been created over so many years. Maybe it's the mixture of so many customs and traditions. Um, but I would say in like 2017, what was new to the situation was really two things. One was uh, President Trump and myself as a proxy, and then MBS, yeah. right? And so with those two dynamics, we were able to disrupt the inertia yeah. and then really change the paradigm of what was there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have this other line in the book where you say, recognizing Israel's annexation of the Golan was a powerful opportunity for America to stand for the truth. Yeah. And, but, but, you know, that felt like very moral language. Like, for example, I don't imagine you would say, oh, let's also stand for the truth of the fact that, you know, the one China policy doesn't make any sense and there actually should be an independent country called Taiwan. You wouldn't stand for that truth. Yeah, I, I, I well, I think that that was a truth that didn't conflict with one of our strategic right. interests. Okay, fair enough. Okay, but fair but enough. but I'll tell you. But, 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 <laughs> fair enough. Fair but, enough. But 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 I'll but I'll tell you where we did do that. Right, we did that in the Western Sahara. Yeah. Right. right. We recognized the uh, the Western Sahara as being part of Morocco yeah. because again we thought that was in our interests and it was yeah. true. And so it was just like one of these. And again, that has not been undone too. One thing I'm proud of with a lot of the work I did in government. People talk about how it was a divided time. Um, Abraham Accords have been bipartisan uh, praised. Yeah. Uh, and now the Biden administration has, has followed our policy after two years. They've reversed course. They're embracing Saudi Arabia. All the things we are doing, they're now trying to do, which is, I think, a great affirmation of the policy. And it's good. Um, uh, the prison reform we did, 87 votes in the Senate. Yeah. Uh, you look at the uh, USMCA trade deal, we had over nine. So my view is if you pursue the things in the right way and you build consensus, you actually can move forward big things. So Western Star, we did the right thing and we were able to then work hard to convince everyone to come on board. Okay, I, I, we're com coming to the time where I, I have to uh, take questions for the students, otherwise I will not make it out of here alive. But I, I wanted to ask you just one last uh, issue I wanted to describe. You talk about yourself as trying to move big things forward. Another person trying to move big things forward who is a friend of yours is Mohammed bin Salman, and I think the, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. And I think you and I are in agreement that he's probably one of the most consequential people in the world right now in terms of the magnitude of what he's trying to do and in terms of how important it is for the world that he succeeds. But I think th when I look at him and what he's trying to do, there are some things that just kind of give me pause. And I'm, I'm asking you as a friend of his to help me understand why these things shouldn't give me pause. So I'm totally going to uh, overlook the Gamal Khashoggi thing or, you know, the, the you know, deta detention of the uh, a Lebanese prime minister or the Ritz Carlton. Like, just looking at some of the developmental plans, like the line, which is this hundred mile long, you know, uh, linear city. And you're you're a real estate guy. Like, does the line make sense to you? Or what? I look at this and I think this seems to me to like a guy who's got a lot of testosterone and nobody who wants to tell him no. What am I getting wrong? Got it. So he definitely has very high RPMs, right? He, he's he, he's um, from the first time I met him. So so the way I'll, I'll give a little bit of context. So Mohammed bin Salman is now the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. Um, when when we were in the campaign in 2016, everyone you know, Trump was very tough on Saudi. 
And then I write in my book, if you want to go through and read it, I was very, very rough with them when they came in trying to speak. And I said, look, we want nothing to do with you guys. You know, you guys fund terrorism. You treat women terribly. Uh, you're not ascribing to Western values. You've got to pay for your own defense. Like, you got to recognize Israel. Like, we're done. Like, you know, this is going to be a very rough, rough go. And they did not get along with Obama because Obama basically went to, to Persia and did the deal with Iran, which made all of our allies feel very alienated. So they basically came back and said, no, 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 we, we really, really value the U.S. relationship. It's been our strongest relationship forever. And we have this young deputy crown prince who really wants to go forward and make a difference here, and he wants to change things. And, um, and so then basically we had a big debate internally, and he sent me a whole proposal uh, through his guys, uh, guy, uh, Dr. Fahd El-Tuzi and, and Dr. Masad al -Aiban. And they basically brought a proposal that basically said, we're going to you know, do all these modernizations, we're going to get rid of the custodianship laws, we're going to start allowing women to drive. And by the way, we're not doing this for you. We're doing this because we want to do it. Right? We're going to be uh, eliminating the role of the religious police. At the time, we had the Pulse Night Club, Club shooting. We had the San Bernardino shooting. The biggest problem in 2016, a big issue in the campaign, was really uh, radicalization. Right? ISIS had a caliphate the size of Ohio. And the whole talking point was we need to defeat the territorial caliphate of ISIS, and then we need to win the long-term battle against extremism. There was a real fear that these extremists were basically using online mechanisms to radicalize people all over the world. Uh, we needed to stop the flow of funds to terrorists. So they came with a proposal saying Saudi Arabia, the custodian of the two holy mosques, is going to lean into this and help you create a whole center where we're going to now single-handedly lead the fight with you to fight online extremism and radicalization. We're going to be, and by the way, they never called it modernizing Islam. He would always say, I want to restore Islam. He says, these people who are the, who are the terrorists, the, the, the ISIS, they don't represent Islam. They are they are basically doing awful things in the name of Islam, and they are giving us Muslims a bad name, and we are just as aligned with you. Again, we don't think Trump is against Muslims. We think he's against Islamic extremists who pervert our religion. So they came with this whole proposal. Look, we're going to do hundreds of billions of dollars of investment in the U.S. Uh, we're going to do. Uh, we're going to start paying for a lot more of our defense. And it was like a dream come true from everything that Trump. I, I thought Trump would like. They bring the proposal again. Me had knowing absolutely nothing about Saudi Arabia, nothing about uh, foreign policy. I bring it to the national security team and I say, "Well, th this is a proposal we got from Saudi. Is this uh, is this interesting?" They said, "Jared." one of these things would be revolutionary. I said, well, they're saying they're gonna do all of it if we kind of lean into the relationship. So then we go into the situation room to kind of assess, you know, what do we do with this? And I'm sitting with uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis, uh, Tillerson, John Kelly, Homeland Security, uh, and they're all saying, Saudi Arabia, and Tillerson's saying, I've dealt with the Saudis all my life. I ran ExxonMobil, I know the Saudis. They never keep their word and they never come through. You know, Jared, it, it's a nice thing, but you're a young, naive guy, and uh, you know, it's, it's not gonna go anywhere. I said, look, they're putting it all in writing. I said, why should we predetermine them to a future where nothing happens? If they're saying they wanna make these changes, let's give them a little bit of rope. So we take it to the president, and he's doing a call with King Salman, and before the call, we're having this debate. They say, you know, you're in deal with King Salman. We have uh, we deal with his uh, his brother uh, Mohammed bin Naif, uh, who's the uh, the intelligence chief, and uh, he's a great ally for the U.S. And I said, well, if he's such a good ally to the U.S., why do we have all these terrorist concerns with Saudi that you guys keep complaining about? And I said, look, I just want you to know, I have a proposal from another guy there who's the deputy crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, and he's saying he wants to do all these things to really change really big things that will really make a difference. So. The call gets on the line. President Trump takes the call, speaks to King Salman. It was a pretty rough call because Trump, as you know, can be very blunt. And he, uh, he basically says, we want to see changes and we want to see them fast. And what King Salman basically says to him is, we're ready to lean in. We want to really strengthen the relationship with America. We did not like how it went before. And uh, we're ready to do it. And so President Trump says, who should my team deal with? And he says, deal with my son, the Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. So then he says, let him deal with Jared. And the reason why he chose me for us, he knew the other guys weren't believers and they'd probably sabotage. So I get back to my desk and I have a note from him. We worked uh, uh, basically uh, for like 90 days straight to set up this trip. He sent his top guys to Washington. I got every single thing in writing. I couldn't get people in the White House to come to the meetings to plan the trip because they basically said, this is going to be a disaster. We are all going to be embarrassed and we want Jared to take the blame. We're taking off for the trip. I'm thinking to myself, why do I always do this to myself? We could have just gone to Mexico and like cut a ribbon. Like, what do I have to do this for? You know? So we go there, and uh, I actually would encourage you to read or watch uh, President Trump's speech from Riyadh because he basically said, hey, "You'll excuse my French." He says, "Look, I'm not going there to kiss ass." He says, "I'm going there to kind of lay down markers and say um, th this is what needs to change and this is what we need to do." He went there with a very tough, realistic speech, and he basically said, "This is not 
your problem. This is not our problem. This is all of our problems. We want to get these terrorists out of our homes, get them out of our mosques. Let's get them out of this world. And it was very, very rough. And the king of Saudi Arabia gets up there and says, there is no glory in death, yeah. which also was a big statement. So I'm giving a long uh, lead up to say this is where we are. Um, over that visit, I, I had dinner with the crown prince, then the deputy crown prince. And I remember he said something to me, which was amazing, which he said, you know, my father's generation, they were kind of in the desert. You know, they, they really didn't have a lot. And they look at the city of Riyadh today with airports and military, and they got so much further than they ever dreamed they could. He says, my generation, we look at all of the potential that our country has that's not being, yeah. that's not being sought after, and we see it as a big wasted opportunity. We want to go to much, much higher, higher, higher heights. We believe in, in, in Saudi. I always say there's a reason why Saudi is such a big territory. They were yeah. amazing warriors back in the day. So it's an incredible people that have been very repressed through bad leadership for a long time. So... Again, people were very surprised, the first reform, the second reform. And keep in mind, you had the religious police. People thought if he tried this stuff, they would kill him. And he was able to kind of you know, move so quickly on so many reforms that he's freed that next generation. When we did our conference in Bahrain in 2019, um, one of the challenges we had was finding role models for young uh, Middle Eastern kids, young Palestinian kids, say, who are the new tech entrepreneurs? Who's the Mark Zuckerberg or the Elon Musk that these kids should look up to? Now, I was in Saudi Arabia probably five months ago, and I had a, a meeting with like 30 tech entrepreneurs, and this guy's building you know, the X of Saudi, the Y of Saudi. They're building all these great startups, and it's just, he's unleashed a whole new generation of that. He once said to me as well, something which was amazing, where he said, you know, because I, I was saying to him, you've got all these ambitious projects. I said, are you sure it's a good thing to be doing all this? Again, yeah. we're friends, and, and uh, we're able to have honest discussions yes. with each other. Uh, we've had some tough discussions. We've had some, some fun discussions. Yeah. Um, but he basically looked at me and he said, Jared, he said, look, the way I view this is we have a country with amazing potential. Yeah. As a leader, most leaders will say, let me do two or three things. Yeah. And then you set low expectations and you achieve it and you declare success. He says, that's not my approach. He says, my approach is I want to take on 100 things. Yeah. And if I fail at 50 things, instead of looking back in five years and saying, I accomplished three things, I'll say, I accomplished 50 things. And so I think he's going for it in that way. So well, if you want to look at the significance of him, and I'll, I'll say this, you know, the Khashoggi thing was a, an absolutely terrible situation, uh, but I think the American media got very fixated on it. And it's funny, I had a, a journalist, um, uh, one, somebody who's an editor of a, a magazine calls me because she was uh, moderating a panel uh, with some Saudi ministers and said, can you give me some advice on what I should ask them about? And I said, well, let's go away from the conventional stuff. Why don't you talk about what it's like to run a KPI-driven uh, 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 KPI government? I said, that would be a very interesting conversation. It was a business conference. Performance indicator. Yeah. So, so she said, she, I said, look, you know, you should go there and see what's happening. It is, it is one of the most exciting places now in the world. And she says, oh, I can't go there. My colleagues will kill me. And the, so I'm saying to myself, well, that's not curiosity in journalism. So one of the biggest misperceptions I believe right now in America is the American journalists are not paying attention to what's happening there. And it's one of the most exciting transformations in the world. And if you think about why I am a believer that in Gaza or in the West Bank, yeah. there's hope to transform those societies and take the people who right now, people say, oh, they're all radicalized. Um, you know, how can we transform them? Look what's happened in Saudi Arabia over five years. So if you think about him in the context of, 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 a, of, um, of kind of like the, the, the 21st century and, and, and how we'll look at it, I think that I put half of it in the context of the amount of extremism and radicalization that we are not having to deal with because of the way that he's taken Saudi Arabia in a different direction. I think that's a, it's funny, in politics, you know, again, I, I look at some of the things we're talking about saying, oh, well, you know, we're going in and we're solving a problem. We're going and solving the border crisis that we basically created, right? Here, he's spending a lot of time and effort and risk yeah. to have avoided what I think are massive, potentially unovercomable problems. The other side of it is the contributions, right? And so there we're kind of in the middle phase. I think he's already accomplished, to be honest with you, um, from when I met him the first time and he told me about a lot of these dreams, yeah. uh, I think he's accomplished way more than I think anyone could have expected. Yeah. And I think the cool thing is, is he's just getting warmed up. And so now you think about these projects, he's a very out of the box thinker. Yeah. Uh, I see that he's getting better and better the ministers around him, uh, again, they, they all sit around. It's like sitting with the, the, the leadership team of a startup. Um, they're getting better and better. They're competitive with each other, but in a friendly way. And I think that there's a real ambition and an appetite for risk there that you don't see in a lot of countries. And they have the resources. And, and you think about the location, right? They have access to, in the Gulf right now, one of the reasons I'm so bullish there 
is you have access to the European market and to the yeah. U.S. market, but then you have access to the Asian market where there's massive, massive growth. So you look at the circumference around them, you have like 4 billion people. Yeah. And you've got a lot, you have established markets, emerging markets. They have a, you know, net, net, uh, net surpluses because of their oil trade. Yeah. Um, they're making massive investments in renewables. They're being a true leader in a lot of fronts. And I think that's very exciting. So again, I was very, uh, without him, I don't think we would have been able to turn the tide in the region. Um, I'm still very optimistic. I think now it's funny they're they're talking about with Israel. It's not a question of if; it's a question of 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 when and 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 how and for what, yeah. right? And so those negotiations are ongoing. I think they could be they could they could conclude in a week from now. They could yeah. conclude in a year from now. But they're going to happen, and that's all because of the effort that he's bringing. And I think that you're going to see a different Middle East, a different um, a different world because of the work he's done. So, yeah. so I, I think it's very exciting. You're definitely bullish, clearly bullish on uh, on MBS and on Saudi. Are you so bullish on them that you'd invest there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, look, one of the, the challenges of investing there is mm -hmm. that they're doing so much investment internally. Mm -hmm. uh, I've looked at several things. You know, we made one great investment in the UAE in an online classifieds business, which is basically correlated to the growth in real estate. But UAE in this last conflict really said, we want to take the role of Switzerland. And so they basically have said, we're not getting involved. We've been in the middle of too many things. And so they, they've had an explosion in their market. And that's been a massively successful investment for us. Yeah. Uh, that business is going into Saudi as well. And we have another uh, couple of businesses we're looking in Saudi. And uh, I definitely would invest in the right way. Again, you have to get comfortable. It's, it's like every market has its insiders and its local customs. So we've yeah. gone slowly, uh, but I am very bullish there. All right. So uh, when we started here, I told you you should never count on a middle-aged Egyptian man uh, to keep time, particularly when you're talking to somebody as interesting as Jared Kushner. So can we take like maybe two questions? Is that cool? So um, I, I want to call on students in my class, IJ655. And the first person I have is uh, Zantana Ephraim, so, who's right over here. Yep. Hi, Jared. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, so the question I'd submitted to Professor Masood is this. Um, as you're undoubtedly aware, there have been numerous significant discussions across the country surrounding the campus culture in higher education, particularly in relation to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, these conversations often touch upon anti-Palestinian sentiments, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism. Um, I assume your presence here today suggests that you recognize the necessity of what the Harvard Kennedy School calls candid conversations, um, particularly within institutions of higher education. In light of this, could you share your perspective on areas where you believe Harvard University, its donors, or students may have faltered or faced missteps in addressing the complexities of the conflict on our campus? Sure. So um, I'll be honest. When I got reached out to from, from Tarek, it was at a time where a lot of my friends were getting very, very negative on Harvard. and. Um, and I've always been somebody, I'm not big into condemnation, I'm big in, in engagement. Every now and then you got to do condemnation, but you know, they say like, you know, you don't make peace with your friends, you have to kind of like go out there and, and go into places that are uncomfortable. Uh, I will say that, and by the way, I'll say one other a pretext, which is I got here about an hour before this and I was walking around campus and uh, you guys are all so lucky to be here. This place is absolutely amazing. It is so special. Um, it survived for a long time and it's it's always been a beacon of excellence. And uh, like all great institutions, perhaps maybe it lost its way a little bit. Uh, I'm sure that's happened in the past. I have not studied the history of Harvard as much as I have some of these other topics. Um, but what, much harder. The history of Harvard. Yeah. Okay. yeah but, but what I would say is this, is that um, I, I'm more interested in, in kind of tomorrow and the future, right? I think that what we've been through was, has been a very interesting time um, for the country. I think it's been an interesting time in the world. I think there's been a lot of emotions. Um, I think I would just encourage people, no matter what your persuasion is, to figure out how to engage, right? I think that, um, I, I saw this when I was in New York before I went into the political world, I, I only had like one friend who was a Republican. I remember sitting here at Harvard and the things that we would say about George Bush and, and how certain and how arrogant we were about his policies. And by the way, I, I'm not a fan of, of him as a president. I don't think he was a good president. Um, but, um, but it was such a... Um, uh, a self-righteousness about the thought that now I look back on reflection and I see. I saw the same thing in New York where the echo chamber I was in, which I thought was like a very worldly echo chamber. I was with the heads of the banks, the heads of the hedge funds, the heads of the fashion companies, the heads of the technology companies. We'd be at our house, we'd have artists over. And I thought I'd have journalists. I thought I was just with this very um, eclectic, uh, worldly, diverse group. It turned out I was just in a massive echo chamber. And what I would say for all of you is, is I would say, try to pursue independent thought 
um, when people are screaming, uh, I'm not sure that that's necessarily um, the most productive way. I would try to do your research. I would try to be with people on both sides, and I would try to engage. This place has a very special history. It has a lot of uh, a lot of that special to it. And I think that, you know, if each of you say, how can we try to contribute to make this a, a comfortable place for everyone? Uh, let's learn. Let's continue to grow and evolve. I, I think that is possible that this place can hopefully come back to where it has the potential to be. Great. Okay, we'll take one more. Um, I have uh, Barack Sella over here. Hi, uh, my name is Barack Sella. I'm a student in Tarek's class. Um, so let's pretend that in a year from now you are Secretary of State and looking at sort of the, you know, uh, situation of uh, foreign policy in the U.S., a lot of dissatisfaction on the right and the left. And post-October 7th, Knowing that we can't go back, you're always talking about going forward. How should America's foreign policy in the Middle East change uh, regarding the challenges that are now facing the Middle East, Israel, the Arab world after October 7th? What has changed? How has it changed fundamentally how the United States needs to approach its foreign policy? Um, so, uh, first of all, I'm just going to say all this is as a hypothetical, uh, right? Uh, which is always <laughs> dangerous to do. But uh, what I would say is that... Um, if you go back for, I think, you know, look, when, when, when President Clinton left office, you know, America was an N of one superpower in the world and it was mostly peaceful. Um, you think about uh, through both the Bush and Obama administrations, uh, I think the foreign policy of both administrations uh, did not achieve great results and made the world a lot less safe, allowed China to rise, uh, you know, got us into war in Iraq, uh, war in Afghanistan, uh, led to a big instability in the region, which, uh, again, when President Trump got in in 2017, we had to deal with like literally a decade and a half of massive mismanagement. Again, I think we, we spent the whole time trying to fix a lot of problems that we inherited. And I think at the end, we left it with a lot of good momentum. How do you go back to where we had it and then build upon it in that regard? I think there's kind of a couple, couple things. And, and I wish everything was like black and white, but I found in foreign policy, like in most things in life, there's always like a thousand shades of gray. Um, and you need to figure out how everything connects to everything else. So number one is that you need to impose a penalty on Iran, and, and you need them to feel like there is a risk uh, to keep uh, the trouble they, they are making, right? So uh, what President Trump used to say about Iran is that they've never won a war, but they've never lost a negotiation. So they're always uh, going around, feeling, trying. Uh, in 2017, in 2016, Iran, uh, after the JCPOA, uh, when Obama left office, was selling about 2.7 million barrels a day of oil. By the end of the Trump administration, they were selling 100,000 uh, barrels of oil a day on the illicit market. So basically, we totally dissected their economy. They were out of foreign currency reserves, and, um, and they were dead broke. I mean, they're, they're pretty good with ballistic missiles, but their air force is from like the 1970s. So they had no capabilities. Wars are expensive. They had no capabilities to withstand war. And we had the world pretty united in enforcing the sanctions against them. And that was a very tough battle with Europe uh, and with China and with Russia and a lot of others. But we were able to create enough issues that were else we were able to really kind of put them in a box and make them fear us. So I would say number one is you have to focus on Iran. And they have to feel, first of all, start cramping down on their resources. And number two, uh, you need to create some kind of uh, fear that this behavior is not going to be uh, treated uh, lightly. Um, I also think there's an issue where you need to figure out how to reset the relationship with China, and I think you need to figure out an end to the uh, Russia-Ukraine war. I don't think there's much there that's happening. Um, I, I think that you know Russia wants to see us now more distracted, so I do think that they're incentivized to be what, against whatever position the U.S. is in the Middle East, right? So let's say the U.S. came out tomorrow and said we're against Israel, Russia would then go back Israel, right? I think that there's a dynamic there where they want to see us distracted so that we focus less on them. And so I think that that uh, conflict strategically is not good for us. I think you need a resolution there. Um, so I think number one is contain Iran. Uh, number two is we, we took a little bit of a different approach than, the, than the, the administrations before us and after us with Hamas. So if you go back with Hamas, they had the same business plan from basically 2006 up until like 2017, right? Uh, they would fire rockets into Israel. Uh, Israel would overreact. The world would then reflexively condemn Israel, right? Because every one of their military targets is underneath a school or a, a residential area. You know, they, 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 you know, Israel sends out leaflets saying, please, you know, civilians move, we're about to bomb, which not, that really eliminates the element of surprise. Uh, 
And, uh, and so, but, but, you know, they basically would, would, would fire rockets into Israel. Israel would overreact. The world would condemn Israel. Then there'd be a conference. They'd raise money. Hamas would get cash. They'd be good for a couple of years. They'd run out of money. They'd say, what should we do? So, oh, I've got an idea. Let's fire rocks into Israel. Israel will overreact. The world will condemn Israel. They'll hold a conference. We'll get some more money. We'll be good for a couple of years. When Hamas did that the first time with us, we, the, the, what the State Department was saying is we urged both sides to show restraint. We basically did something different. We said, Israel's the right to defend itself. We support that. Israel went in, bombed the crowd. We said, no more money. We're not putting more money in until they stop bombing. We're not putting good money after bad. If you guys actually show us a paradigm, the thing with Gaza that was different from the West Bank is there was no religious sites, right? So it was a very, there's no border disputes and there's no religious sites. So it was kind of like a very simple concept of like, you guys stop being terrorists and we'll figure out how to rebuild the place. And, um, and so the notion there was like, like show them that there's going to be a real, they're not going to be rewarded for their bad actions. Like now giving them a Palestinian state is basically a reinforcement of, we are going to reward you for bad actions, right? Which you're giving Hamas a Palestinian state, you're giving Palestinians a Palestinian state. What do you think that will do for the popularity of Hamas? And for people, if you're, if you're a young person and you have two people trying to uh, influence you and you have Muhammad Abbas saying, my way of being peaceful has what brought us a state. By the way, they all think he's corrupt. They don't like when you criticize their government. But he says, my way of being peaceful. Or you have Hamas saying, the only way we ever got anything was by going in and killing and raping and murdering. And we showed them that we can be tough and they feared us and the world rewarded us for it. So my sense is it's an unbelievably awful precedent to do. You have to show terrorists that there will not be tolerated and that we will take strong action. So number one, you've got to you know, put some cr uh, cramps on Iran. Uh, number two, you have to be very tough at going after the terrorists. Number three, you have to work with everyone. There was a lot of trust eroded um, uh, in the region. Uh, you know, since since we left, you know, UAE was shot uh, from the Houthis. Uh, by the way, they had anyway, it doesn't matter. So, um, but but bottom line is, that then I, I would focus on how do you get the deal with Saudi done, and, and those talks continue to evolve. And I did an interview uh, with Lex Friedman, um, basically the like two days after, and he asked me, "Is the Saudi deal dead uh, with Israel?" I said, "No, no, no. The industrial logic is still strong there. It's just now Israel's going to have to do what they're going to do, and then when it's done, it's in the interest of all sides. So Israel still wants that deal." The Biden administration still wants that deal, and Saudi still wants that deal. So that deal is still very much alive. And it's interesting, too, the dynamics. You know, the Biden guys initially said they're going to make Saudi a pariah, and now they're basically running over there, begging them for help to try to figure out how to kind of get this resolved. So, so, so the long answer is, I think that's really how you have to do it. You have to stand with Israel. I think it's, it's very, very important. We made, we, we deterred a lot of threats because we stood with Israel. I think the North right now is combustible. Uh, I, I am nervous. I think the U.S. did the right move sending the carriers over initially. Um, but it just takes, a, it's like, a, think about it like a, a woods with a lot of uh, dry, dry, um, dry leaves. It just takes a little spark and that thing can conflate. There, it's a pretty tough situation. You need a long-term plan to try to uh, uh, diffuse that situation, but you have to figure out how to hope. But it's about being strong, being strong with, with, with Israel, uh, containing Iran, uh, showing the terrorists they're not going to be rewarded for their actions and working closely with your partners in Egypt, uh, Jordan, and the Gulf to try to figure out how to continue the economic project that we started. But, Jared, you've got to agree with me, and then we'll, we'll have to end. You've got to agree with me that ultimately, at the end of the day, the real deal with Arabs that matters for Israel is with Palestinians. Well, I'll, I'll just say this as... Um, I think that for Israel and actually for the Jewish people, having a proper resolution to that is very important, right? Because I do think that that's been an excuse for a lot of global anti-Semitism to hide behind during the, behind this conflict. Um, and I think that that's been, although so I think it's definitely within the interests of Israel and the Jewish people to find a resolution to the issue. But, and this is the most important but, it has to be a solution that's sustainable. And when you ask me what's my biggest fear, my biggest fear is that you have a lot of people who are chasing a deal for the sake of a deal and not looking to make a deal that will really leave this in a position where it, it allows, it makes future conflict less likely. And the way you do that is by creating a paradigm where you don't reward bad behavior. You need the right institutions to allow the Palestinian people to live a better life. You know, you said something to me when we were talking. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, or I could just say I heard this from a friend. Um, 
And, uh, and I actually thought it was really smart. It had me thinking, and it's, it's absolutely true, you know, that, that Oslo has been a total failure. And again, we've all worked in the constructs of that. But, you know, if you think about it, you know, for, for all these years in the Middle East, again, before you had all these countries and all these arbitrary lines that we spoke about with Sykes-Picot, you basically had a situation where you had the tribal system. And, and still, there's still form of governance in the different cities and towns in the tribal system. Oslo, I went before about how Arafat was in Jordan. He tried to assassinate the king. They, they basically, you know, they had Black uh, Saturday. They, September. Black September. They, they got these guys out. They went up to, uh, to, to Lebanon. They caused a problem with Le Lebanon. They kicked them out of Lebanon. They went to your favorite place, Tunisia. Uh, they're in Tunisia sitting in uh, villas on the beach, basically broke and, 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 and there. And then the U.S. and Israel have this great idea of saying, we're going to take this, this former terrorist who's sitting in a villa in Tunisia, and we're going to put him in charge of the Palestinians. And then all of a sudden, you've got this like tribal system that's been working there for a long time. They're like, why the hell is this guy in charge of us? And then for 30 years, we've had nothing but failure. The people's lives have not gotten better, and that hasn't worked. So uh, again, my, 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 my fear is that I'm seeing a lot of conventional thinking with the same people who have failed. Uh, again, you go to a boss, he's like a broken record. He said the same thing and his record of non-achieving is not good. And my fear is really for the people because I think that they've been pawns in this situation. And, and the one thing I'll say strongly, you know, if people are very, people who, who are pro, I always say this, there's like four categories in this conflict. You have pro-Israel, that's acceptable. You have indifferent, that's acceptable. You have pro-Palestinian, that's acceptable. You have pro-Hamas, that is not acceptable, right? You think about if you want to be pro-Palestinian, the best thing you can do is say, the people who have been holding these people back is their leadership. When we held a conference in Bahrain, so I'll do this part very quickly, then we'll wrap. Um, we held a conference in Bahrain. I built, again, go to my piece to prosperity, Google it, you'll go through. I have a full business plan that I built. It's a 183 page uh, document that goes through all the different changes you need and every investment that we would make in order to build a functioning society. Um, we had every businessman from around the world. Steve Schwartzman came, Randall Steve from AT&T, had all the leading Arab businessmen. And they all said, we wanna do things to make the lives of the Palestinian people better. And we will, we will invest there. But the reason we're not going to invest there, again, you can't have jobs and prosperity without investment, right? They still teach capitalism at Harvard, I think. So, uh, yeah. and, uh, and, secretly. And, secretly, right? And, uh, and capitalism is like a very powerful force towards, uh, towards improving people's lives. And that's been proven, you know, time and time again. Um, and so what they all said is the reason we're not, not investing has nothing to do with Israel. It has to do with there's no rule of law. We don't want to go build a factory or a power plant then have it blown up by terrorism. We don't want, there's no property rights. How are we going to go you know, do something then it's expropriated by these thugs? And so what I would say is that without the proper Palestinian leadership, and again, you can't just say, oh, we're going to do a reinvigorated Palestinian authority. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. You need a new idea that's actually going to work because you don't want, if you're Israel, yes, I think, and a lot of Israelis at their core, they want the Palestinians to live a better life. They want a Palestinians, the state right now, the state means a lot of things. So it's a very controversial word, even though it shouldn't be because it means different things to different people. But the fundamental underlying part of it that's essential is, is there a governing structure in this area for the Palestinian people that will not threaten Israel security-wise and that will give the Palestinian people the opportunity to live a better life? Without those two things, nothing is acceptable. You can call it whatever the hell you want. Yeah. Yeah, and I think so. So I think this is a really important note to end on, though, because I think anybody who leaves here would think, well, the tune that Jared Kushner really wants us to hum is that the number one most important thing that we've got to do is invest in the building of Palestinian institutions. And I don't know how you do that while, uh, you know, a big chunk of Palestine is under uh, this massive bombing campaign. So, so what I would say this is like, that's one of the cool I'll things. I'll give you the last word. Okay, cool. Point. Yeah. So, so one of the things I, I learned also in, in government is that, especially in the Middle East, the number one rule you should follow when doing it is that if they're not screaming at you, you're not on the right path, right? Because well, all of the- I I'm always on the right path. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so the conventional thinking in that region has just, the track record of everyone who's going to be talking is just wrong, right? So think about it. Again, we go back to like, how do I look at it? First principles, results-oriented, results-outcome, and how do you advance- uh, uh, human prosperity. How do you get? How do you advance human potential? How do you give people the chance to live safe, have better life? If it doesn't fit in those criteria, and you put patchwork on it, then you're doing what politicians do. Which again, Trump, coming from the business world, myself coming from the business world, you, a problem's either solved or it's not. 
right? You can't put a Band-Aid on something and call it solved because it's going to go back. I think the psychology right now of Israel is very much, we can never let this happen again. And so I think what they're doing is they're hoping that a solution will develop. And again, I think this is the, the, the burden now that the Biden administration carries. I think the Arab countries want to see this happen as well. But I do think there's a, a very uh, big desire to come up with a solution that will make everyone more prosperous and more safe in the long term. And that's what it's about, right? I, again, I, I have friends now who are Muslims, who are Christians, who are Jews. When I would go sit with people, they knew I was Jewish. I was an envoy from America. We were all the same people. We have the same blood in our veins. And, and when we recognize that, we all kind of want to make things better, uh, whether you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you know, Israeli, Palestinian. And if you kind of come in with that framing, then there's a lot of progress that you can make. But, but you can't do stupid things short term that you'll pay the price for long term. Okay, this is a good note to end on. First of all, I want to thank you, Jared, for coming uh, to Harvard. I know it's your old stomping grounds, but one could be forgiven for thinking it's like going to enemy territory. Hopefully you feel that uh, the, the, this was uh, a welcoming environment and we can get you to come back so we can argue some more with a bunch of things that you said that I still want to argue with, but we don't have time for. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming and just being an exemplary uh, Harvard audience. And so please uh, join me in thanking Jared Kushner. Thank you. Thank you.